Hello, welcome everybody to this fourth and last short paper session at Eurovis 2021. Um, my name is Manuela Waldner. I'm from Theovin and I will be chairing this session on um, information visualization. We have five very exciting talks in this session, all about different aspects um, in the area of information visualization. And we will start right now with the first talk, uh, which will be given by Lei Shen Shen, and it will be about task-oriented visualization recommendation. Hello, everyone. I'm Lei Shen Shen. It's a great honor to introduce our recent work, Task-based, task-oriented visualization recommendation. My talk will include the following eight parts. First is the background. Recently, visualization recommendation is verified to be an effective way to promote data analytics. This rank can automatically generate well-designed charts, allowing users to easily traverse the space of visualizations and focus on the most relevant ones. We conduct a survey of existing with rank systems, including their models, supported chart types, and the degree of automation. We found that they are only able to pull meaningless charts but fail to recommend targeted visualizations about the user's analysis tasks. In response to the aforementioned problems, our goal is to leverage detailed modeling of analysis tasks to automatically generate diverse visualizations based on the data properties and the tasks. In addition, we will provide users with various level APIs to balance automation and the user's intent. However, building such a practical with rank system also faces its following changes. First is capturing human perception. It's hard to quantify that which visualization is good, better, or the best. Second is large search space. Many factors such as selections for columns, groups, access, marks, and uh, aggregations can create a huge search space. The third is knowledge construction. Where to obtain visualization knowledge and how to construct knowledge in a formal framework. The last one is lack of ground truth. Finding good visualizations is a mining task. Unfortunately, the ground truth of a given dataset is often unavailable. Next is the overview of our approach. Users can input the datasets, optional columns of interest, and the analysis tasks chosen from the task base at will. The preprocess module will extract data features automatically. In the visualization generation module, convention to ASP constraints is a promise to make input available for Silingo software, which is an unsuccessful programming system to solve logic programs. Apart from the user's input, a role base is the core of task base and should also be sent into Silingo. All emulated results in unsuccessful programming constraints are later transformed into Vegalite. In the visualization ranking module, each, each visualization is assigned a cost value based on a cost map. On this base, four ranking schemas are designed for users to select. Finally, a with rank list is presented to the user. The whole solution can be mainly divided into three parts, task modeling, visualization generation, and visualization ranking, which will be introduced in detail below. In task modeling, we focus on which tasks should be included, suitable chart types for each task, and the knowledge modeling of tasks. In fact, both academia and the industry have already conducted some empirical studies of the analysis tasks, but they only focus on specific aspects. While our task modeling organized and summarized the three parts of the material, the first is the empirical academic studies the second is the virus guide summarized on visualization practice in industry, such as finance, news, and geography. The third is customized tasks commonly used in practice. On the base of aforementioned materials, after deep discussion by multi-visualization scholars and graduate students, we summarized a task base with 18 classical low-level analysis tasks and the suitable chart types for each task. For example, as for change of time task, line chart is the most suitable and the area chart is the second. In visualization generation module, we focus on visualization specification, visualization components, and how to pull meaningless visualizations. We use Vegalite to specify visualizations, which is a high-level grammar of interactive graphic as shown in the left side. 
There are various components in the Vegalite official documents, which are mainly divided into three categories, mark, encoding, and transform. We made some necessary selections and integrated them into a task base. And uh, these are 14 types of charts supported in task base. As we adopt a rule-based approach, if we use traditional FLS programming structure to manage all the rules, the code will be messy and difficult to manage. Following the idea of Dranko, we leverage an on-set programming to construct the rules in a uniform framework and then use the lingo software to solve the program. ASP is a dedicated programming paradigm based on logic programs and their answer set. It provides a simple but powerful modern language to solve combination problems. This is an example. The user's input will be automatically converted into ASP constraints, then sent into Cilingo software along with the rules. Cilingo emulates all the candidate visualizations in ASP constraints and finally transformed into Vegalite. The last module is the visualization ranking. We need to score each visualization first and then design rank schemas based on the score. Inspired by Grabscape, we generate a cost map for each component in Vegalite through the idea of solving linear programming. Compared to Graphscape, the cost map in TaskBase adds more actions, more details, and it is task-oriented. For example, given a bar chart when analyzing sort task, we can get the following cost set and finally compute the cost score by adding up the score for each component. Obviously, the smaller the cost score, the simpler the chart is. On the basis of scoring, we design four rank schemas. The first is complexity-based. It sorts visualizations according to the complexity from low to high. The second is the reverse complexity-based charts with higher complexity come first in this schema. The third is the interested columns based. This schema is mainly related to the columns of interest inputted by the user. The last is task coverage-based. Charts covering more tasks should be recommended first. We also recommend the default rank schema for each task and the users can also select any rank schemas freely. Next, we will show some examples recommended by TaskBase. This is an example of comparison task for car state set. From the bar charts, line charts, and scatter charts, we can easily compare the production and the performance of cars in different regions. This is an example of change of time task for weather data set. The recommended line charts and area charts clearly show how some perception parameters change over time in different locations and weather conditions. This is an example of determine range task for flight delay dataset. This is an example of special task for COVID-19 dataset. The map labeled with text and color shows the geographical distribution of the confirmed and dead cases in the United States. This is an example of sort task for Hollywood stories dataset. Using bar charts to sort Hollywood stories according to different indicators can help us find high quality stories. Now, suppose that we are exploring a dataset of cars with different types of columns. Virus analysis tasks can be explored in this dataset. Illustrated with example, this picture lists the representative results ranked in the forefront for each task recommended by TaskBase. The histogram in characterized distribution task provides distribution information of horsepower attribute. The range of displacement with different cylinders can be clearly observed with the box plot chart in determined range task. The pie chart in part two whole task reveals how the dataset can be divided into three components, Europe, Japan, and the USA. Next is the evaluation of task base. We conduct two user studies in experiment one. Given a chart, we ask the participants, how can you get information from the chart with a specific task? The answer strong means you can get rich information about the task, weak means Although not rich, you can still find some information related to the task, or none means the chart has nothing to do with the task at all. In experiment 2, given a recommended chart, we require the participants to select the tasks 
They think the chart can reflect by multi choices. Finally, we receive 22 valid answer sheets. The results show that TaskWays could well reflect the user's preference. Please refer to our paper and supplementary materials for more details. Finally is the conclusion. The contributions of TaskBase are as follows. First, we summarize a task base of 18 classical low-level analysis tasks with the appropriate chart types by a survey both in academia and the industry. On this basis, we further maintain a rule base which extends in practical wisdom with our targeted modeling of analysis tasks. Second, we realize a task-oriented recommendation engine that supports four visualization ranking schemas. It offers various APIs to allow flexible input of the user's tasks and interests. Third, we conduct two human subjects experiments to evaluate the extent to which task weights can reflect the user's analysis tasks. As to future work, first is to extract abundant data properties. The properties of multidimensional static data are beneficial for targeted recommendations, such as standard deviation, coefficient of variance, and exact. However, only data type, length, and cardinality are considered in current vision. The second is to integrate semantic occurrence. Taskways only integrates data properties in the numerical sense, but does not consider the semantic meaning. In the future, we will combine natural language processing models to integrate the semantic occurrence into TaskBase. The last one is a natural language interface for data visualization. Over the years, the repeated development of NLP technologies provides a great opportunity to explore a natural language-based interaction paradigm for data visualization. With the help of VNLIs, users can express their analysis intent in their own terms. That's all. Thanks for your watching. Thank you very much, Li Shen, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we do not have any questions yet, so I encourage the audience to ask questions on Discord and, and YouTube. And I will just start with a question on my own uh, to get started with. Um, so your system makes recommendations based on, on data characteristics and, and task characteristics. Uh, yeah. Have you also considered taking user characteristics into account, like uh, prior knowledge or, or user interests? Yeah, um, we, could, uh, we allow users to input their interested columns and uh, tasks. So um, users can input um, no tasks and uh, you can uh, input one task or multi tasks. Uh, of course, the current is. Mm -hmm. Have you also considered like um, some vision deficiencies or, or other personal traits of users that could influence the way how they interpret the visualizations? Uh, yeah, uh, in the future, we will consider uh, the, the options you, uh, you mentioned. But uh, in this vision, we haven't, uh, have not considered. Uh, thanks for your uh, valuable suggestions. Okay, we still don't have any any questions, so I will continue with a uh, with the second one. Uh, so in your evaluation, so you showed the the users the optimal choices, right? So the recommendations, the task uh, to this would give you. Did I did I understand this correctly? In the first evaluation. Oh uh, yeah 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 yes. Um, did you try to compare this to a non-optimal choice, so something that that uh, task to this would not recommend? and compare uh, the, the user responses? Uh, yes, in, in future, we will, we will also to do some, some work, do some work about it. But in this vision, we have, have not considered it. Uh, and we, uh, this is a short paper, so in the future, we will do more work. OK. I think somebody is typing, so. Um, okay, so we have a question by Klaus Eckelt, which is, is there a limit on the number of columns that users can specify, or will it then create multiple visualizations? Uh, yeah, uh, I have mentioned that uh, users can input uh, the interested columns. Um, he, can, uh, he can input uh, one column uh, or no columns. Uh, at default, if users input no columns, we will consider all the columns at default. 
Okay. Um, and maybe if there's no more question from the audience, I will ask a last one. So you presented your task taxonomy. Can you maybe shortly comment on how it differs from existing task taxonomies like the one from Amar and Stasco? Uh, okay. it, it seems that there, there's a, quite some overlap, right? Is it more extensive or does it also differ in the kind of, of low level tasks? Uh, okay, okay. Um, pressure studies has documented that the effectiveness of visualization logic depends on the user's identity task. And however, most of existing systems um, lack a detailed modeling of analysis tasks. So um, they are only able to promote the trials but fail to recommend the targeted visualizations. So, um, uh, even if some works have taken analysis tasks into account, the comprehensiveness is still, uh, is still insufficient. Um, for example, um, Janko only uh, group tasks into two categories, uh, value tasks and uh, summary tasks. Uh, and for DV only into with uh, uh, five, five, ta five types of low-level analysis tasks. Um, but in, uh, in our system, we uh, leverage detailed modeling of analysis tasks and uh, summarize a uh, um, task base with 18 classic low-level analysis tasks and uh, uh, integrate them into our system. Okay, I think there do not seem to be any more questions. So let's thank yeah. uh, Lei Shen again for his very nice okay. presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we switch to the second talk, uh, which is called Toward an Interactive Voronoi Tree Map for Manual Arrangement and Grouping. And the presentation will be given by Michel Opetit from the Qatar Computing Research Institute. I'm Michael Opetit. I will present you a joint work with Ala Abuzawabe, uh, made at Qatar Computing Research Institute. It's about interactive Voronoi Tree Map for Manual Arrangement and Grouping. We frequently need to arrange and group objects in the physical world. Uh, this is also important in the digital world. Uh, you can imagine data coming from any domain. Each instance is represented by an image, either natural or from data visualization. And we need to manually arrange and group objects based on their image representation. Here, for instance, grouping and arranging objects based on the pattern you see in the image. So what are arrangement and grouping tasks? Arrangement is about positioning objects. It helps understand the diversity and variations of objects through side-by-side -side comparison of their images. It makes more visible small differences for finding outliers or typical objects and deciding about grouping. And it makes faster the location of objects like an index in a library. Grouping is about creating categories of objects. It creates categories, concepts, classes where no one exists yet. It generates seed classes to be used for supervised learning, and it makes faster the search of objects, clusters, box, colored area, piles. The same exists in uh, visualization. You can have, uh, you use proximity uh, when you see cluster in scatterplot. Enclosure is used in tree map. Nakedness is used in piling, and common region is used in circle tree map. Shall we use manual or automatic arrangement and grouping? So we prefer to use manual arrangement and grouping because it makes more effective knowledge acquisition about the objects and their diversity by active multicentral perception rather than just visual observation. It supports the progressive generation of concepts groups and their relations, mental map. So it's usually better to use manual uh, arrangement and grouping in a data exploratory, exploratory data analysis uh, case. That doesn't mean we will not use automation, but we shall not use automation at the start because it would bias users' mental model with arbitrary computational measures of similarity and decision, and decision uh, threshold of the automatic model. 
And even if we use automation from start, it's important to let the user, uh, to support the user to manually modify groups and arrangement to better match, fix, or generate our own mental model. Anyway, after a while, when explicit seed groups are formed by the user, and these groups are, are meaningful, uh, a proper similarity measure can be learned from them and used to automatize further the arrangement and grouping of additional data. So what are the design challenges to, to, to create a visualization that supports arrangement and grouping? There are four of them from a literature review. So why do we want to avoid occlusion? As you see on the left, uh, when you have occlusion, you do not see all the image at once, so you do have no overview, and it prevents easy comparison of side-by-side side -side, uh, comparison of images. On the right, we have an example where it's easier to arrange and group objects because we can see all of them at once. Uh, why do we want explicit grouping? On the left, you have an implicit grouping based on proximity, so it can be ambiguous, and it's only in the user head. It's not encoded in the machine. On the right, we have an example of an explicit grouping where the machine knows about the group based on these uh, color-coded areas. So the machine can help the user, assist the user in the arrangement and grouping task. Why do you want to use all available space? You don't want to waste pixels. Pixels is a scarce resource in visualization, and so we want to optimize the use of space and the use of pixels. You can use space filling approach for that, uh, but in that case, uh, you, you will need to use an explicit uh, representation of groups because you can no more use proximity-based uh, grouping uh, if you use such uh, space filling approach. At last, uh, why do we want to allow free positioning? Because we want to maximize expressiveness of the user. On the left, you have an example where the image are aligned on the grid layout which is kind of constraining the user to, to, to express a mountain model. On the right, it's free positioning, so it's better. So we studied the related work, and uh, we, did, we found two kind of techniques. Techniques designed to support arrangement and grouping tasks, and visual metaphor not enriched to support visual uh, uh, and arrangement and grouping tasks. And whatever uh, the approach, we found that no one of the interactive arrangement and grouping techniques fulfill all the requirements. And among the visual metaphor, no one uh, fulfill all the requirements except the Voronoi tree map. So that's why in the following we focus on Voronoi tree maps. So we encode Voronoi tree map for arrangement and grouping task. It's a specific Voronoi tree map where we have three levels. The first level, the top level, is the root polygon, the root cell. It's a polygon. Here it's a square. Then we have uh, this square is partitioned into uh, cells representing the groups. And these cells are cells of a power diagram, so weighted Voronoi cells. The groups are color coded. This fulfills the design requirement of explicit and convex groups. And at last, the last level is represented by images of the objects. Uh, these cells are standard Voronoi cells, they are not weighted, which allows to maintain the same size for all the objects, all the images, and the images are located at the center of the, at the centroid of the cell. So the, the weight, the, the, the group cell size is proportional, the weight of the group cells is proportional to the number of objects that group contain. We design interaction for arrangement, grouping, and presenting. For arrangement, uh, to ensure free positioning, we use a drag and drop of image of an object or of representative image of a group. So we can arrange an object or arrange a group by drag and drop. And to fulfill the avoid occlusion uh, requirement, we use centroidal Voronoi tessellation <coughs> that spreads image uniformly in group cells with so avoid occlusion. For grouping, we can uh, create a group by moving, uh, dragging an object outside the grandparent cell. It will create a group 
nearby the place where we drop the object. We use CVT to update the arrangement of the other images. Then uh, we can add an object to a group by dragging this object and dropping it into the group cell. It will uh, update the size of the group cell by increasing uh, its weight for the target cell and by decreasing the weight of the source uh, group cell. And then we rearrange the object within the groups by using CVT. So we, it preserves the mental map, just update the position slightly to fill in the space. We can choose a representative image of a group by double click on that image. It will be useful to arrange a group, to collapse or expand a group. We can uh, merge two groups by drawing a, a zigzag line across the common boundaries uh, between these two groups. And we can split a group by drawing a, a line across several images. So using line selection, it will create a group based on these images all at once. We can also um, define a target group by double click on the background cell of a group. When, a, when there is a target group, when we drag an image, we just need to start the drag move and the image is automatically teleported to the group. So it's faster. And we can also line select multiple images. So they will be all at once added to the target group. For presentation, uh, we can rescale the size of all images at once using uh, the scroll wheel, or we can get a bigger image for a single object by clicking on that image. We can also optimize the use of space by collapsing or expanding groups. So by double click on a representative image of a group, the image of that group collapse be below this image, so it creates a pile. And the size of the group is updated, so the weighted the weight of the weighted Voronoi cell is decreased. And so, because there is less image to display, uh, we can increase the size automatically of all the images. And we can do the opposite. We can expand the group and come back to the initial situation. And so, the size of the image will be automatically decreased because there, there is more image to display. We propose two use cases. One is about an art museum quiz game. So we develop a quiz game to remind to visitors of an art museum the artifact they view during their visit. The task for them is to group pictures by, by artist and style. We know the ground truth, so we can compute a score uh, regarding the matching between the user groups and the ground truth groups. So we can indicate to the user um, where are the errors in, their, in his grouping, and we can also, of course, at the end, if the user is, is good, he can recover all the, the groups and get the maximum score. Uh, another uh, use case is a qualitative uh, comparison between our voluntary map metaphor and the piling metaphor. So we have 64 images of IC data represented as heat maps, and the task is to group images by visual pattern similarity. Uh, we use piling.js for the piling metaphor. And so here, what happens with the piling metaphor is that when we start uh, dragging object to create piles, uh, it creates empty space. So the, the space is not optimized. The use of space is not optimal. Uh, and when, uh, as you can see, the content of the group is not visible. It is hidden in the pile. Uh, you can only see one image one by one by uh, going over the, the, the pile itself, but only one image at a time. If you want to see all the images in a group, in a pile, you have to expand the, the pile, so you will get this visualization. But the problem is that when you expand the pile, it hides the rest of the map. Uh, so you lose the mental map, the mental map of the user. And at the end, you get a set of piles as a final grouping. In the tree map, we always show all the images at any time. So uh, you always show the content of the group, uh, the global appearance of the map is the same, just the arrangement change and the, when uh, the objects are dropped in some area of the, of the map, uh, they belong to a new group. So overall, the, the images keep the same size, the group content is visible and preserves the mental map. The CVT only slightly changes the position of the object, does not drastically change the position, so the arrangement is preserved. If we want to save some space, we can collapse the group into piles 
And because we do that, we have less image to display, so we can increase the size of the image to maximize the use of pixels. And this is an example of final grouping. So this is a short demo of the one tree map. You see that we can add uh, images to groups, create a target group, line select to, in to put the image in the group all at once. We then can collapse a group to save some space. You see that the size of the image increase. And when we expand the group, the size of the image uh, decreases to adapt to the available space. It avoids occlusion and maintain maximal use of space. What you can also see is that uh, the CVT is always used during arrangement and grouping to maintain the mental map. So there is a little change in the arrangement when we change the posi object position. So it maintains the void occlusion and it's automatic. It uses the centroidal volume tessellation. So what are the limitations of your work? If you want to handle more than 100 of image, you need to to consider visual scalability and task scalability. Uh, so for visual scalability, you need to use group collapse and page navig navigation and not show more than about 100 images. It depends on the size of the screen, of course. And for task scalability, it's difficult to ask the user to, to manually arrange and group more than about 100 of images. So in that case, you need to use automation, machine learning, for instance, using dimension reduction technique for arrangement, clustering for the grouping, and classification for assignment of image to groups. Regarding the multi-level tree map, uh, we can still use the interaction at a given level of the tree map, uh, but we would need to add interaction to navigate, arrange, and group objects through multiple levels. We plan a quantitative uh, analysis of the quiz game for the art museum and a qualitative analysis for arrangement and grouping of EL's data with the domain expert. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation, Michael. Um, I'm here now with both authors. So Michael and Arla are both here. And um, I think there, there's already one question on, um, on Discord, which is um, by Kunting. Very interesting methods. Have you considered using constraint-based layouts like ColorGS to adjust the layout of images, avoiding occlusion or improving aesthetics? Anna, do you want to answer? Um, currently, we don't uh, 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 explore the, 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 the images for, uh, to adjust the images. We use currently automatic uh, uh, adjusting for for the images. If if you create the groups, it will uh, uh, like it will compute the Dironi uh, graph of the of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, Voronoi, and it will uh, compute the distance, uh, the average uh, distance, and it will fit all the, the, the sizes of the images according to this uh, distance. Yeah. But uh, actually, still, we didn't uh, go further to uh, another uh, constraint uh, basically out for the images. Um, hey. Maybe I can add a, a quick, uh, an answer to that. Um, uh, yes, I see collage, yes. I didn't know about it. Um, I think we what the main dif the, the novelty in our case is to use CVT to do the, to avoid the overlap. But that's a good uh, idea to compare to what is proposed in CollaGS. I see there are many options to avoid overlap, basically. So in our case, we really focus on the on the idioms, which is the, the voluntary map, and try to exploit all, all, all this capacity. And so as it is based on Voronoi cells, we can use Voronoi, centroidal Voronoi tessellation to try to maximize the space, preserving the arrangement. And so that's what we, we explore in this in this work. Okay, so while the audience is thinking of more questions, I, I will continue with one of my own. And this is uh, when you collapse a group in, your, in, in one of the Voronoi cells, so you only show one picture um, or one data item. So how do you choose this item to show? I think this is pretty critical how, it, how the group is represented, I guess. Yeah, currently uh, the user shows the, the, this uh, representative images, yeah. And, uh, in future, we will try to uh, find another way to, to, to pick which one that it uh, most represents the images. Yeah. 
but currently we 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 let the user uh, choose the representative manually and then we uh, um, he, the, the user can uh, by interaction he select the, the or she select the, the, the this images here and by default it will choose the first one uh, as i remember in the implementation yeah I think this is actually a, an, an, an interesting an interesting aspect because it can very strongly influence how the user perceives the group. Yeah. I think in general it's a very very interesting tension between autom automation and the purely manual arrangement that you that you're mentioning here. And I think there's a lot of work that could be explored also in terms of studies, like how to incorporate automation. So have you yeah. thought maybe about some visual guidance um, techniques to not change the layout itself, but to maybe give some hints how the user, where the user should look at what the user, what the user could change about, about the layout? Um, uh, still, we didn't uh, explore this. Uh, I mean, we start with the machine learning. Yeah, we, we the machine learning. I, I can answer this. Uh, yeah, the, we start exploring that part, but uh, with machine learning approach. Mm -hmm where we uh, kind of highlight, um, we get the user by highlighting the different images uh, by proximity to the, to the potential group mm -hmm. running. Um, so we have different approach, but we can uh, basically run a classifier uh, based on the pre-existing pre group that the user created. We can uh, take, that, take that as classes. And so we can train a classifier to give weight to each image uh, basically to get the probability that an image belongs to a group. And based on this probability, we can either push the image directly to the group, or we can just direct the image toward the group and stop it at the boundary to let the user make the last move. So we, we have the, this uh, possibility to, I mean, it's not yet implemented, we, we work on that. Um, but, but this possibility to let the user uh, take the final decision or to automatize when the user is really confident that the class he already created are sufficiently rich and uh, discriminative to, to let the machine uh, do the rest. So that's what we, we work on at the moment to expand, uh, to, to, to tackle the scalability issue when we have more than hundreds of objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so one thing I was also wondering about this explicit and, and uh, implicit grouping. Um, so what about cases where the user is not sure in which group a uh, picture belongs? I mean, a classic multi-label classification problem. So maybe you have two items on a picture and it could go both ways. Is there a way to in your system to handle these cases? Um, currently, we... Um... Uh, we have, we have, we can like uh, having uh, in, in internally in, in, in the data structure, we can identify the, the ID of the images. Let's say we can have duplicate for the, the, the images. So, so the user can duplicate, uh, let's say if he, if he think that uh, uh, an image can be belong to, uh, to, to different uh, classes or uh, groups. So uh, we didn't, uh, what we think about it, but we still in the progress to, to implement that. Yeah. But uh, we can identify the, like having a duplicate for the images, um, we can identify by uh, like having ID for the, the, the duplicate for that image. Okay, so maybe maybe one long, last question from my side. So you said you, you do not want to rely on computer similarity measures for, for the layout. Um, so the layout is initialized randomly at the, at the beginning. Okay, so have you considered, I, I think this could be also a very interesting study, like comparing how much actually the initialization influences the user in terms of, of how, they, how they group the items. So have you considered um, um, going in that direction? So really which influence does it have uh, the layout at the very beginning? If we take the similarities into account, the data inherent uh, similarities. Um, what, what we have, we have uh, like, uh, Different options at the beginning that the user can can have uh, uh, build the, the the hierarchy from the scratch, or uh, like if they are uh, predefined the uh, hierarchy, uh, we uh, we depend on the the, uh, the layout algorithm to to, to do uh, the layout for that. Uh, uh, so so it, it uh, 
we can, if they are the, uh, like positions for for the group uh, predefined, so uh, we can pass that for the uh, to the uh, uh, to the layout, and it will compute based on on, on uh, predefined uh, positions for for uh, let's say the parents. But uh, we uh, we will we will explore other uh, options to if they are like uh, uh, like. Uh, uh, let's say options that ca ca can in the, let the user uh, uh, get better layout for, for the, at, at the beginning. Okay, I think you opened up a big design space here and there are many options to explore in the future and hope to see more about that. So thank you both again for this discussion. Thank Let's thank the speakers again. Thank you. Okay, our next talk will be given uh, by Alessio Aleo from TU Wien, and it will be about a multi-level approach for event-based dynamic graph drawing. Welcome to the presentation of the short paper, a multi-level approach for event-based dynamic graph drawing, a joint work by the TU Wien and the University of Swansea in the United Kingdom. I am Alessio Aleo, and I will be your presenter. Dynamic network visualization focuses on the challenge of representing the evolution of relationships between entities. Traditionally, the definition of a dynamic graph is the following. A sequence of static graphs, one for each time instant, tau, which gi is a time slice of gamma. We can see a representation of this concept in the picture in the bottom right corner of this slide. Time slicing has several advantages. First, since each time slice is a static graph, existing layout algorithms can be easily adapted for the dynamic problem. Research improved time slice drawing significantly, for example, by preserving the mental map. Therefore, when the temporal features of the graph have easily recognizable and unambiguous temporal resolution, it is a popular and fairly effective approach. In this example, we have a class assignment dynamic graph. If we would like to apply time slicing to it, we would easily choose a yearly temporal resolution for our time slices, and in this way we would have two clean time slices without any loss of temporal information. There are cases, however, in which the dataset does not present a natural temporal resolution. In this example, we have three tweets, each one tweeted in a different day between May and June, and each one is related to the previous by means of a reply to relationship. If we would like to time slice this graph, we would have the problem to choose the correct temporal resolution. We could go for a monthly resolution, which seems a reasonable guess, and we would have two time slices, one for May and one for June. However, we would lose the information that tweet 1 came before tweet 2, with 13 days of temporal information lost. We could try daily resolution. In this way, there is no temporal information that is lost in this discretization. However, we have several blank time slices. Finally, to avoid this, we might go for an early resolution. We would have only one slice, which is very convenient, but at the same time, we would lose significant temporal information. So, what is the alternative? To overcome this limitation of time slicing, temporal graphs were introduced. Each node and edge presents time-dependent attributes with real-time coordinates. Among these, two are of particular importance. Appearance, which is a function in time that yields true every time an odd or an edge exists, and position, which is another function of time that defines the position of the node in the plane or in space. We define as duration the sum of all intervals in which AV yields true. When defined this way, the node's position are represented as trajectories through time, embedded in a 3D space known as the space-time cube. On the right side, you can see a static representation of such cube, in which the trajectories are clearly visible. These trajectories encode the node's movement. Each band represents an event, such as an edge appearing or a node appearing or disappearing, that influences the node position. The main advantage is that there is no quantization error since there is no need to discretize the time axis. By exploiting this, we might obtain better drawing quality than time sliced approaches on event-based data. Existing literature proves this.
In fact, on the right, you see DinoSlice, an event-based dynamic graph drawing algorithm that maintains structure in time. On the left side, we have Visoni, a state-of-the-art graph drawing layout algorithm for time-sliced graphs. The visual artifacts due to the time slicing of an event-based graph are evident here and have an adverse effect on the final layout quality. DinoSlice research showed the potential of event-based graph drawing on temporal graphs. However, the computational complexity limits its adaptation. Therefore, we present MultiDinos, the first multi-level accelerated event-based algorithm for offline dynamic graph drawing. We aim at running times that are comparable to those obtained by time-sliced approaches. All this while keeping all the advantages of event-based graph drawing. Our idea is to apply a multi-level coursing refinement scheme inspired by existing approaches for static graph. First, coarsening is executed, and a hierarchy of coarse version of the input graph is created. Afterwards, the coarsest level of the hierarchy is placed and this bootstraps the refinement stage. Refinement is an iterative stage in which each level of the hierarchy is laid out and the computed drawing information is used to optimally place a level below. Refinement ends when the finest level of the hierarchy, the input graph, is drawn. In the context of static graph drawing, the effect of coarsening is easily represented. Each new level will be a simple representation of the previous one, but trying to carry out its key properties, like, for example, the size of each cluster. In our context, the presence of time makes the task much more challenging. To coarsen the trajectories, first, we flatten the temporal graph into a weighted static graph, in which the weights on nodes and edges represent their duration. Then, we reintroduce weights as a static attribute A flat, and the flattening is only needed before the first coarsening, since weights will propagate up through the hierarchy. Once this is done, let's see what happens at level n when creating level n plus 1. Let's assume that that is the graph that we need to coarsen. First, vertices are ranked by their A-flat attribute. The heaviest vertex is selected to be a representative at level n plus 1. Then we select a subset of neighbors of Vn that will be merged with it at the next level. When merging, all attributes are summed in the nodes at the upper level. This process is repeated until all vertices in the level have been selected or merged, and then the edges topology is recreated and the edge weights are summed and propagated as well. We implemented three different coarsening strategies whose role is to select which neighbors to merge together when a representative is chosen. The first one is the maximal matching in which trajectories are merged in pairs. Then we have the maximal independent set inspired by grip approach in which all neighboring trajectories are merged with the representative. And finally, we have the galaxy partitioning inspired by FM cube in which all trajectories up to distance two are merged with VN. Once the coarsening is done, the objective of the placement is to obtain a favorable starting point which would speed up the convergence to a good layout. In our context, placement means embedding the trajectories in the space-time cube. First, the initial placement is computed. In the first level placement, this is done by flattening and then drawing using a static graph layout the coarsest graph in the hierarchy. In the placement during the refinement cycles, instead, these coordinates will be transferred from the upper level to the level below. Once placed, the trajectories are extruded through time. The layout stage will bend them, allowing the nodes to move. In the refinement cycle, the trajectories of the nodes that were merged with their representatives have to be placed as well. These are computed starting from the coordinates of their representatives. To obtain this, we implemented three strategies. Two are shown here. The third one, the identity placer, can be found in the paper. In the body center placement, the neighboring trajectories are placed skewed towards the body center of the coordinates of their representatives' neighbors at the upper level. These newly computed trajectories will be kept close to their own representative. The solar placement uses the information gathered during the coarsening stage to place the trajectories based on the relative position they hold in the paths between representatives at level n plus 1. When using the galaxy partitioning, in fact, we merge together trajectories up to distance 2 from their own representative. This puts an upper bound to the maximum path length between representative nodes. 
With this information, we can precisely calculate the position of any trajectory in every path it belongs to and place it accordingly. After placement, the layout stage begins. Layout is computed using DinoSlice, an event-based layout technique. A pivotal point in multi-level approaches is that parameters that define the layout quality of the algorithm are adjusted through the levels. Specifically, we modify three drawing parameters of DinoSlice the max knot movement, the number of iteration, and the frequency of the trajectory optimization. The first two are set to the standard of Dino Slice in the first refinement cycle, and there is a 7% linear decrease per each level in both. The costly trajectory optimization is first performed every two levels, with this interval growing by two every optimization round. Our research question can be formulated as follows. Can multi-dinos be faster than dino slice while retaining the advantages of event-based graph drawing? To respond to this question, we run an evaluation testing the performance and drawing quality of the following techniques. First, there is Visoni, the state-of-the-art technique for time-slice graphs. Then we have Dino Slice, the event based layout technique also used in multi dinos. Multi dinos with three different combinations of coarsening and placement strategies, and a baseline, which is flattening the dynamic graph and then drawing it using SFTP. These are the quality metrics that we use to competitively evaluate the quality of the layouts. Specifically, stress on and stress off are computed after optimal scaling is applied. Depth is not a quality metric per se, but can be used to understand the effect of coarsening on a final layout quality. More details about the choice of the metrics and the scaling is available on the paper. These are the graphs that are used in our evaluation. First, let's discuss the multi dinos variance performance. We have three variants, the first one with the techniques for coarsening and placement from Walshow, then GRIP, and finally FM Cube. We also tested the effect of the algorithm used for the first level placement. Overall, the Walshow variant performed the worst on all graph, regardless of the first placement technique. I said GRIP proved to have a slight advantage in terms of drawing quality over SMSP. While the full results are available in the paper, in the following slides we will show the results of the ICT GRIP plus FTP variant of multi-dinos. By looking at the running times of the competing techniques, we can easily see how multi-dinos is much faster than dino slice and has running times that are comparable with Visoni. Flattening plus SFDP always had the lowest running times. Concerning the stress metric, multi-dinos is always either competitive or comparable with dino slice. It's worth noticing that on InfoVis, which is a time-sliced graph, both event-based solutions outperform Visoni. Flattening plus SFTP, except for dialogues, provide poorer performance than the competition. Multidinos is designed to provide low movement layouts. As we saw previously, Visoni struggles with event based data, and you can see that here in the movement figures in the rugby and dialogues graphs, which are event based. Concerning crowding, for most graphs there was none. Dino Slice and Multidinos perform similarly in this regard. Bisoni had the worst crowding on the Dialogues graph, while SFTP has very high crowding on InfoVis, suggesting an airbally layout. Stress on values add a similar trend to stress off and can be found in the paper. In this demo, we can see how Dino Slice compares to Multidinos. Multidinos provide much more stable drawings, and only when a lot of activity is ongoing, the movement becomes more apparent. On InfoVis graph, event-based layout greatly outperforms time-slice layout. We conjecture this to be due to the rapid changes in neighborhoods between time-slices, making this dataset more similar to event-based data. The results of our evaluation suggest that indeed multi-dinos can be faster than dino slice up to an order of magnitude with quality figures that are comparable or better. Multi-dinos is designed to yield layouts with low movement thanks to its multi-level pipeline. 
Node trajectories are therefore less influenced by short-lived edges or vertices. As a result, node movement is easier to track and follow. We've also shown that in these cases, non-node movement is not desirable as well, with flattening plus SFTP having overall lower quality figures. In conclusion, we can say that Multidinos scales up event-based dynamic graph drawing with substantial improvements over existing techniques. Future work include testing Multidinos on larger instances that were before inaccessible to Dino Slice alone. In this case, baseline might be more difficult to outperform. This research opens an interesting new problem. When to use event-based layout over time sliced or static graph drawing? with further experiments needed on metrics to predict algorithm final drawing quality in order to choose between the best alternative. Please follow the links to know more about the paper and access the code of our implementation of the algorithm. I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you, Alessio, for this very dense and interesting talk. Um, uh, I would encourage the audience to ask questions on Discord or on YouTube. So far, we do not have any questions yet. So I guess I will start with one. So it seems that your approach depends a lot on the node aggregation step. Is this right? Yeah. yeah. So have you experimented with different node aggregation techniques, like also maybe topology based or, or maybe based on the time slicing? Yeah, the aggregation, uh, or it's one of the main steps of this uh, pipeline because allow us to create the hierarchy then then in the end we'll have a, a, a large impact on what is the final uh, drawing. And uh, uh, yeah, as um, we tested uh, different kind of aggregations that were all taken from existing uh, uh, literature. And uh, uh, in the end, we selected the three that were presented in the uh, in the in the slides. And uh, um, the results were uh, uh, that somehow favored the independent set over the other two. And uh, but definitely, we also like to test other methodologies like using quadries, like uh, uh, SFTP and others. Okay, so we have a question on YouTube by Martin Skrotsky. Um, how many levels does the multi-level hierarchy typically create? And to what number of vertices do you go down on the coarsest level in general? Uh, well, uh, we, uh, in terms of levels, it depends because uh, then uh, uh, there are cases in which we have a very shallow hierarchy. So we have kind of two or three but uh, we tend to have an average number of five, kind of depending on the, the type of the graph, uh, because then uh, as long as you aggregate the, uh, I mean, we tend to avoid having very, very deep hierarchies, especially with similar sizes, because more, the more levels, the more levels you have to draw, so the, more, the longest are the drawing times. So uh, yes, we have a lower bound, a threshold that we set after which we, de we declare that the coarsening is done. So that's the smallest possible, which is in the tens. However, we implement several mechanis mechanisms in between to make sure that each level uh, is uh, um, significant. Significant meaning that it's uh, smaller, significant is more than the one that is before and that uh, uh, the, in order to avoid these large, long chains of levels that in the end will just make all the whole computations lower. Okay, and there's another question on, on Discord by Kunting. Is there any trade-off between improving the running time and retaining the layout quality you gain from the multi-level layout algorithm? Yes, definitely. In fact, uh, um, as you have seen, we uh, shown how we uh, modify because one of the pivot points of multi-level layouts is that you have you can modify the parameters on the fly. However, this also has an impact on uh, on the trade-off between quality and running times, which is something that you never stop exploring. In fact the values that we use in these experiments were made after many, many uh, rounds of trial and error. Uh, 
uh, in fact, uh, one thing that we are experimenting with uh, is not movement, for example, because you saw that uh, layouts are more stable and movement is typically so seen as an uh, aesthetic, meaning that the lowest, the better. But of course, it doesn't have to be too, too low. Uh, also, there are other uh, improvements, and I encourage to have written on the paper on that, uh, that are made alternatively during levels. And this trade-off is something that we keep exploring because sometimes we celebrate it because we were very fast, but also the quality was kind of poor. So uh, we also plan to do more experiments on that. Thanks for the question. Okay, so we have time for a last question. And there's one on YouTube. Uh, so how did you arrive at the number of level threshold? Uh, so there is no level threshold, meaning that there is no upper bound to the number of levels you can create. There is an, an, a lower bound of nodes that one level can, uh, can have. So meaning that if you have only 20 nodes left to aggregate, then, then you don't aggregate them anymore. That, uh, is the, that will be the final, the final, uh, the final level. Uh, of course, as I said, some quirks have to be considered when creating this aggregation. And, uh, but we can tend to keep it as flexible as possible so that we can accommodate also different kinds of situations. Okay, so if there are still unanswered questions, you can continue the discussion in Discord or Topia. And let's thank Alessio again for his talk. Thank you. So the next talk is about selective angular brushing and parallel coordinate plots. And the talk will be given by Raphael Sahan from the University of Vienna. Welcome to the presentation about selective angular brushing of parallel coordinate plots. My name is Raphael Sahan, and in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to present our novel brushing method for parallel coordinate plots. Our brushing method allows you to select a range of similarly angled lines from a single starting point on an axis with one intuitive click and drag mouse gesture. Before showing you the technique in action, I will start by giving some background on how we came up with this idea and how existing brushing techniques currently handle this interaction. I will then elaborate on how our brushing method works and how you can use it. We also ran two intimate user studies to test the usability and intuitiveness of our approach, which subsequently led us to extend it to cope with large datasets. We identified a range of additional applications and approaches that could benefit from this brushing technique, which I will shortly highlight before concluding this talk. Parallel coordinate plots are a powerful and commonly used way of displaying multi-dimensional datasets. A crucial point of working with parallel coordinates is interaction. With our technique, we do not focus on sorting or filtering, but on brushing. Brushing in parallel coordinates is used to highlight a subset of the displayed polylines in contrast to the rest. We came across the need to highlight a specific angular selection when working with great data of different university courses. Each parallel axis in our visualization displayed a class, and we showed grades vertically on each axis. We now wanted to highlight all students who had an A in one class and got worse grades in the following. With this task in mind, we started to look for available solutions. In their work, on smart brushing for parallel coordinates, Roberts et al. classify a range of existing brushing techniques. Luckily, the composite first order brush can highlight polylines according to our needs. We needed to select a range solely containing grade A on the first axis, and then the range containing everything but grade A on the second axis. To answer our question, and then we selected another two ranges on two axes for answering the next question. And then again, 
twice for the next question. It turns out that separately selecting ranges on two different axes for multiple consecutive questions became tedious very quickly. There had to be a better way to pick all lines going up or down from one specific point on an axis. This slight annoyance, therefore, led to the conception of our novel brushing technique. Our method achieves the same highlighting as shown before, but uses only one click and drag mouse gesture. We start with a click onto an axis, as seen in step 1. This initially selects all lines running through that point. Dragging the mouse away from the axis while keeping the mouse button pressed starts a range selection. Steps 2, 3 and 4 show two features of this interaction technique. Firstly, the mouse's vertical position relative to the initial click determines the angle of the selection. And secondly, the distance from the starting position controls the range of the selection. The further the mouse moves away, the narrower the selected range gets. This selection is achieved by computing vector A between the initial click position on the axis and the current location of the mouse cursor. The range of the selection, shown here as S, extends perpendicularly to both sides of vector A, with the mouse's position as its center. The length of S is inversely proportional to vector A's length, thus making it shorter the further the mouse moves from the initial click. We color the triangle bound by S, B and C as a visual guide to show the current selection. The following short clip shows the selection method in action. To evaluate our method, we ran two short user studies. The first user study focused on the applicability of selective angular brushing for different sized graphs. While we found out that neither height nor width makes a difference for usability, another crucial point was noted by our users. This first user study did not show the gray triangle highlighting the selected region and only use the coloring of polylines to show the selection. Our users did not find this interaction intuitive enough to use and needed some time to get used to this new concept of interacting with parallel coordinates. Therefore, we decided to add the gray triangle to represent the scope of the current selection visually. In our second user study, we focused on comparing the two versions with and without visual guidance. While using the version with visual guidance, our testers quickly grasped the concept and used it without issues. The usability rating of our method with the triangle highlight was notably higher than in the first study. Counterintuitively, the usability of the unguided counterpart also went up in comparison. When asked about their experience, some users explained that once they learn how the selection reacts to their mouse movement by observing the triangle, they could then easily use it without guidance. Therefore, our user studies conclude that the guided version is very intuitively usable and should be preferred. However, it would still be possible to use the unguided version when providing a short guided demo for first-time users. Another issue that became apparent in our user study was that the selection only relied on selecting a single point on an axis. 
This single selection limited the usefulness for large datasets, in which lines do not necessarily pass through a concrete point. Thus, we extended the interaction to also work with range selectors on an axis. First, the user needs to specify a range on an axis. By clicking onto that range and dragging the mouse away from it, an identical selection technique is applied as before. Instead of a triangle, the shape of the highlighted area is now a quadrilateral, similar to a trapezoid but without parallel sides. In this short clip, you can see the extended selection method in action. A wide range of possible future topics emerged while working on this technique. Because the interaction with our brush always starts at an axis, we can easily combine it with a lasso brush by differentiating based on the proximity of the initial click to an axis. Of course, many other combinations are also imaginable. A general issue we identified when testing with large datasets was rendering a large number of lines with JavaScript. While our test set with 20,000 lines still ran smoothly, we encountered performance issues above 50,000 lines. Depending on the application, it could be feasible to use a faster rendering technique such as WebGL. Another interesting topic is the interaction on touch-enabled devices. We can easily reproduce the simple click and drag gesture by using touch events possibly leading to a better usability of parallel coordinate plots on mobile devices. Finally, we can see this brushing technique applied to other line-based visualizations. It is not inherently limited to parallel coordinates and could also be helpful in node link diagrams. This concludes the selective angular brushing method an intuitive technique for selecting an angle-based range of lines in parallel coordinate plots. A D3.js implementation of our method is available on our GitHub page for you to try today. You can also find the GitHub link in the paper. If you have any questions, please contact us via mail or ask them now during the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Raphael, for this very nice presentation. We have plenty of time for questions, and I hope that people are coming up with questions very soon on Discord or YouTube. But before that, let me start with one of my, my own questions, and um, maybe, maybe an obvious one. So angular brushing has been around for quite some time. Um, so how does selective angular brushing really differ from this, from this existing technique from, from Hedwig Hauser and, and colleagues? So the, the main difference is obviously the um, initial starting point at an angle, uh, at the axis. Angular brushing by Helwig Hauser was our main inspiring um, for this. But um, in the angular brushing, you just select the angle in which you want to select your lines. And then all across the ranges, wherever this angle applies, all those lines get selected. But for our use case, we needed to address the um, lines coming out from a specific point on the axis. So this initial click on the axis specifies the range on that axis, and then the, the angle is defined afterwards. Okay, okay. Um, what I found very interesting about your evaluation was that it, apparently the users learned quite quickly how to operate the technique. And I was hearing that, I was wondering, have you, have you considered doing an, an elicitation study maybe? So instead of giving the users the technique and, and asking, explaining them how to use it, to ask them to select an angular range or a specific range and observe how they would do it? Um, I mean, our first evaluation was kind of in that direction, but I guess we guided them towards how they could use it. Um, this was somewhat due to the fact that not of all of our users were initially familiar with parallel coordinate plots in and itself. Okay, and we found that parallel coordinate plots are generally hard to use even for 
quote unquote expert users. So if somebody didn't have the experience of working with parallel coordinate plots, there was the inherent issue of how to interact with parallel coordinates in, in it itself. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of understandable. I think we have questions now. So the first one is by Alexander Rind. Uh, were performance limitations related to JavaScript or to, to SVG? Um, I think it was because of SVG, but we did not test for that specifically. So we used the D3 library um, and I cannot specify whether it was JavaScript or SVG in general. I just know from previous projects that were also based on the D3 library that switching between D3 and WebGL, so D3 then only for the selection and WebGL for the drawing, um, massively increased our visualizations. That's why we put it in the future work here as well. Okay, so how many how many lines did you render here? So the largest data set that was shown in the um, video had 20,000 lines mm. and our initial studies were run with just above yeah. just like 50 lines or something because it was a student data set and this was just students from our course. Okay. So it was very little lines. Yeah, I, I mean, I had a student who did a performance testing once comparing WebGL, SVG and also Canvas 2D. And it, it seems that 10,000 elements is that it's getting critical. And of course, depending also on your hardware infrastructure, but that's the point where D3 sometimes, sometimes mm -hmm, breaks. Exactly. Um, okay, so we have a question by Max Sondag, uh, which is, do you think a similar approach would work well on dense graph layouts? I'm hopeful that it would. I don't see why it shouldn't, but it has to be studied and it's definitely a, a, a future work task that we want to try to focus on. Mm -hmm. But we still want to kind of like enhance the whole um, usability of this approach for graph layouts and we didn't come to a feasible solution yet. But if you have some and want to collaborate, just let me know. Okay, we have a question by Silvia Mix. Uh, who's first thanking you for the nice talk and visual guidance is important. So did you consider different kinds of visual guidance for your technique? So after our first evaluation, we considered um, how to show this in particular. And um, we found in our internal testing that the triangle selection show, um, works best. We also had a version where we only tested the line at the end, which is basically the base of the triangle that is then shown but this was not intuitive enough because it did not pop out enough to be um, very well perceived, I guess. Um, and we did not consider any others though. So there may be other options as well that we did not consider. Okay, and uh, one more question in Discord by Daniel Aschenbald. Could you comment on extending the technique to select angles on a series of axes instead of just one? I'm afraid this, because it's a, a click and drag action, and I think there may be a, a way, but I guess you're more um, likely to just use the range selection on the axis as shown in the initial example that is also already around because this is um, this works well for multi-selection on multiple axes. So this technique is specifically for the selection of a singular axis, and then you can go to the left and to the right with the mouse, but you're basically limited to your initial starting point. So you can also go into the other direction. So, yeah, obviously. So okay. if you click on an axis, you can go in either direction yeah. and you could go up and okay. down to select. But this initial click is the, the mm. point of reference and I, I guess this okay. stays. Okay, this would have been my, my next question actually, <laughs> if it also works in the other direction. Because sometimes when you have a point selection, I guess it's still easier than doing the range. And so if you're having a point on one side and a range on the other side, I guess it's easier to just go into the other direction. Um, maybe one last question from my point uh, related to the future work concerning touch. Uh, have you also considered pressure sensitive pens? I, I, I think pressure could also be interesting here in terms of, of specifying maybe the, the, uh, the angle or, or kind of the range somehow. Yeah, I guess it would work for the, for the range just to specify with the touch event the the direction and then the pressure de um, depends the, for the range it has to it's, be tested. So we did, yeah, not, it's we did small, not start with touch yet. Yeah, it's a small use case because not too, yes, many, <laughs> not too so many people have. When we were the, talking about um, the touch events, we were specifically thinking about finger touch because it's kind of the, the main yeah. use scenario. 
yeah, makes sense. Okay, so I think there are no more questions on Discord or YouTube. If you have any more questions, so Raphael will be available on Discord or Topia. And let's thank Raphael again for his talk. Now we're coming to the last presentation in this session, which will be about algorithmic improvements on Hilbert and Moore tree maps for visualization of large tree structured data set. And the presentation will be given by Willy Scheibel from the Computer Graphic Systems Group at Hasso Plattner Institute. Hello, I'm Willy Scheibel and I'm from the Computer Graphic Systems Group at the HPI and the University of Potsdam. And today I want to talk about our algorithmic improvements on Hilbert and Moore tree maps for the visualization of tree structured data sets. For some time in the talk, I will hide myself so you can see the slides better. And to start with, um, we know tree maps as a family of tree visualization techniques that are used to uh, visualize predominantly tree structured data. So uh, in our case, on the group, we use tree maps for software visualization. We use it so that the non-spatial software data is spatialized, giving it a gestalt, and in a way that the data structure, the hierarchical data structure is preserved. And we use the rectangular tree maps by means of nested rectangles and additional mappings, uh, for example, color and height, as seen in the example right on the right, to um, yeah, provide full visualization techniques. Our example here is a software map of the Qt open source project. Qt is a uh, actually popular C++ project with hundreds of thousands of source code modules. And we, uh, we use a, a mapping to show complexity within the software. In this talk, uh, we don't want to focus on the full visualization technique known as stream map, but on the underlying layout that is used as a foundation to uh, yeah, extend rectangles to derive geometry for actual visualization and rendering. On the left-hand side, you can see a 2D tree map layout we use, here we use the color as grayscale to yeah, differentiate between rectangles. So it's more a technical color mapping. And on the right side, you see a corresponding 2D tree map visualization with added padding for nesting of child nodes to enhance the hierarchy and color mapping to actually highlight on our mapping what we want to show. I shortly want to reiterate on the algorithm originally proposed by Tuck and Cockburn in 2013. And um, to uh, provide a simple example, we have a tree that is flat. We have eight nodes from A to H with differing weights. Here, for example, two, four, and eight. And for the Hilbert and Moore map algorithm, the order in which the nodes are given is also the same order in which the nodes are processed. So that is, we have to keep this order from A to H. And the algorithm basically states that we want to lay out the elements across a space filling curve, for example, the Hilbert curve or the Moore curve as an alternative. And the algorithm does this by subdividing the list of nodes by four parts or in four parts recursively. And for each part, we have a selection of a template to actually lay out the elements along the curve. And if we apply templates, then we have a resulting layout as seen on the right. The templates proposed in the original paper are those 13 ones. We annotated uh, the potential use either within the Hilbert or the Moore curves. 
So um, for both approaches, we don't have the full set of 14 uh, templates to choose from, but only a subset. So um, when we apply these algorithms, we uh, found some problems and um, the main problem was that our tree structured data can be of larger size. So when we measure a software system information, we uh, may want to measure project with projects with hundreds or thousands of nodes. And um, we may have situations where we need to compute the full layout for the full tree map. And maybe it's not even visible, but it's uh, still um, useful to have the full layout at hand. Um, you may recall my example from the beginning from the QT open source project with, which has above these 100,000 nodes. Uh, so yeah, when applying those algorithms to those data sets, we had actual runtime issues. And uh, through the literature, we found that uh, Hilbert and Moore tree maps were uh, used with tree maps tree maps with up to 60,000 nodes, but nothing above. So uh, what we found is that the main runtime complexity comes from the partitioning subroutine to divide the data in four weighted quadrants that had, have roughly equal weights. And to reiterate on this a little bit further, uh, we found a, a greedy implementation that uses a runtime complexity of O of n to the square. And um, we actually used a, a brute force implementation during our first studies, which has a cubic runtime. You can see it on the right. We have three nested for loops. And um, both these implementations resulted in really long computation times for our data sets. Further, we found that the uh, use of the word roughly from the original proposal allows for a different interpretation of what a good partitioning of the list of weights is. And uh, so we uh, wanted to propose some improvements both on the notion of this roughly and on the algorithmic complexity to allow the computation on uh, larger data sets, up to millions of nodes. So um, to formalize this problem, we want to assume we have an array of numbers with positive weights and its sum. I want to reiterate on our example from before with our eight nodes and the uh, yeah, sum of weights of 32. And um, if we want to uh, um, divide this list of nodes into four uh, parts of roughly equal weight, I want to choose another visualization where I stretch each node um, by its weight. So we have the node A with a weight of two, that stays above the same size. B is, has doubled weight against A, and so it's doubled in size, and D has a weight of eight, so it's doubled against B. And uh, using this visualization, we can just show we want to achieve three cuts to form four partitions of roughly equal size. And uh, for this data set, it's a unique solution, but with real world data, this can get a different pretty soon. So um, the greedy approach um, yeah, gives us a solution to this problem, but we want to propose two further uh, measures that um, gives more quality guarantees for one, we want to propose the min-max partitioning, where the maximum sized partition is minimized. So we achieve optimal 
maximum partition size. This usually means that the uh, if we maximize if we minimize the maximum sized partition, we maximize the uh, yeah, more smaller partitions, so we get roughly equal size. And as a second measure, we want to propose the min variance partitioning. This is basically the same algorithm you saw earlier with the uh, cubic implementation, but uh, this time we optimized it to a um, linear algorithm, linear time algorithm. And um, if you want to know the details, you can look them up in our paper. What we basically achieved with those two algorithms is we added two linear time algorithms with uh, measures with quality assurances regarding the um, yeah, distribution of weights among the four partitions. Next to the measures and these algorithms, we um, provide or we implemented these measures ag again also with the greedy approach. The uh, linear time version of the uh, uh, variance, min variance implementation you can see here. And here I want to show you a demo to give you a glimpse on how to use our prototype and what layouts it can create. So at first I start up and here we have the Firefox dataset once again. This layout is uh, created using the Hilbert tree map layout algorithm using the min variance list of weight partitioning. The startup time you experienced was including the uh, reading of the dataset. So basically a CSV file containing all nodes and their weight information. It includes a pre-processing of the tree, the actual layouting deriving the, geome the geometry and the rendering. I can load up a second viewer too. So I can show the same data set with the same Hilbert tree map algorithm, but this time with the min max partitioning. As you can see in the right tree map viewer, this area is layout as this area uh, using the min max partitioning. You can see similarities, but also differences. This Firefox dataset has uh, roughly above 100,000 nodes. And I want to demonstrate the second uh, dataset as well. A large dataset containing a Trima, a GitHub owner data of repositories. This dataset contains 2.4 million nodes. For this startup, the same holds. So this startup time includes reading the data set, pre-processing the tree, layouting it, and deriving geometry. For our evaluation, we used a list of open source uh, projects from GitHub. We have used projects of different sizes from a couple of hundred nodes up to over 100,000 nodes. As evaluation regarding the uh, layout metrics, we choose the layout metrics average distance change, relative position change, average angular displacement, uh, the rotation invariant relative direction change alternative, and the location drift. Our uh, results show that for these data sets, the metrics perform similarly, similarly well. We have uh, some kind of a drop for the average aspect ratio uh, for the underlying or when we use the underlying Moore curve. But uh, overall, the layout metrics are similar in their qualities 
disregarding the uh, quality measurement. So if we use the greedy approach or the proposed min-max or the proposed min-variance approach. With respect to the runtime, uh, here we have a plot using all three implementations. Um, please uh, regard both axes use a logarithmic mapping. So uh, because of that, we added three symbolic plots that uh, mark the uh, major complexity classes with linear runtime, quadratic runtime and cubic runtime. And we see that all three implementations are basically performing in linear runtime. Uh, here I want to add that um, we optimized the greedy approach, the implementation we found by uh, a running total. Details on this are also in our paper. Yeah, to conclude, um, we provide a formalization of the list of weight partitioning subroutine. With this, we added a notion of optimization criteria for this list of weight partitioning. We added the, or we proposed the min max and min variance partitioning as two further optimization criteria. And we provide implementations for those two optimization criteria that provide optimal solutions are and are in linear runtime as well. And we evaluated these, uh, at, yeah, these improvements by means of layout quality metrics and uh, runtime performance with data sets up to 4.0 million nodes. Uh, looking forward, we want to extend the evaluation further by means of data sets and data set sizes. We want to include even further metrics and want to evaluate if the choice of layout, uh, choice of templates um, can even consider the aspect, target aspect ratios. Currently we use a target aspect ratio of uh, one but current liter literature suggests a target aspect ratio of 1.5 or even the golden ratio. And we want to uh, further evaluate the continuity of the space filling curve that is underlying these layouts. An example you can see here. And we want to see if we can provide TreeMap layouts as a service. So this concludes my talk. I'm now open to answer questions. Thank you really for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. So, so far there's no question on Discord and YouTube, so please go ahead. Um, the session is over very soon, so this is the last chance to ask any more questions. Until we get the, the first questions, I will start with one, which is actually not related to the layout algorithm, but at the very beginning you were showing this example of uh, software visualization, and I was wondering, what do you encode with the colors and the height of the, of the tree map cells? Um, yeah, we uh, usually encode um, software development data um, for height and color mapping. So uh, in this example I showed, uh, we used the McCabe complexity as the uh, color encoding and um, the nesting level for height to uh, approximate um, yeah, the, the understandability of software. So um, large red blocks are uh, probably hard to understand and should be minimized. Okay, okay. Um, so concerning the different partitioning approaches, so the, the quality metrics, if I understand this correct, are not showing any strong differences between these uh, partitioning approaches, but visually the differences are actually pretty clear, clear. So did you informally experience any, any advantages or disadvantages of the two partitioning approaches? And can you comment on this? Uh, I think the main reason we don't experience uh, changes in the metrics are because of our actually low um, data set sizes. So uh, we uh, gathered a large number of data sets, but I think it's still not uh, large enough to see actual effects. Um, I'm currently running experiments on a series of uh, Firefox layouts. Um, it actually uh, takes a really long time, so basically a couple of days, so I'm not 
able to uh, provide uh, updated data at, up to this point in time, but uh, I see uh, differences and I hope I can publish them soon. Okay. Uh, so there's a question on, on Discord by Max Dondag. Uh, what do you mean with providing tree map layouts as a service? Yeah, so um, uh, as a side project, we're currently working on uh, yeah, providing services um, by means of REST APIs or uh, websites. So um, we can provide our underlying implementations um, yeah, to the research community. So you can upload data sets and query the resulting layouts. Okay, so we've heard in the previous talk that that uh, rendering in the web can be can be tedious if the data gets very large. I mean, to a certain extent, this is of course also true for WebGL. So, any thoughts on this? How how well do you think your your uh, your tree maps will scale on the web for yeah. these large examples that yeah. you've shown? So, um, the, the demo viewer I showed uh, is a desktop viewer, but we have a WebGL once as well and are currently porting our viewers to WebGPU. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm pretty confident that uh, data set sizes up to uh, 1 million nodes are no problem for WebGL or WebGPU. I'm very much looking forward to that. So let's thank Willy again and he will be available on, on Discord and Topia for further questions. Yes, thank you. So this ends the last short paper session of Eurovis and the session on information visualization. Thank you again to all the speakers and, and all the people that were here for the discussion. Thank you also for the audience uh, for their questions and enjoy the last day of the conference. Goodbye. <laughs>